Hey everyone. Before we get to the video, I just wanted to take a second to give a huge thank you to all our new patrons. Two weeks ago, I made an announcement that the business is struggling, and the response has been overwhelming. Not just the signups, but also just the kind words and outpouring of support here, on my personal channel, and in the Discord. One more surge like that, and we can stop looking for sponsors entirely, and make Second Thought a 100% grassroots-funded operation. The Discord has been a blast with all the new members. In my opinion, it's the best, most wholesome political server around. If you're interested in helping make this channel completely viewer-funded, consider becoming a patron. Every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to the Discord. We've got everything from a book club, to live Q&As with me, to educators ready to answer any questions you may have about socialism. So once again, from the bottom of my dirty commie heart, thank you to all our wonderful patrons. It's only because of you that we're able to do this work. I hope you enjoy the video. Well, I was gonna make this a big fancy video like always, but Hakeem beat me to this particular topic, and he did a great job, so go and watch his video if you haven't already. I still do want to take a few minutes to answer this question that I get asked a lot. And by a lot, I mean this is probably the single most common question I get. What can we do? This usually comes in the form of, yeah, capitalism is bad, but what can we as individuals do to make a change? And I'm kind of giving the game away a little bit by using that particular wording, but we'll get to that. The original idea for this video was to have a concrete answer I can link people to, because honestly I'm tired of typing out the same answer 30 times every episode. But I do think it's valuable information in its own right. Okay, so what can we do? How to answer that question? If only there were some book I could refer to with that exact question as the title. The more experienced socialists among you have probably already guessed, we're going to be drawing a bit from Lenin's 1902 work, What is to be Done? This is the thing that's both frustrating and useful about questions like these. They've pretty much all been answered for the past, like, hundred years. It's frustrating because we've all had a hundred years to realize that, and read the books, and learn from the past, and it's useful because at least the books exist to point to when people ask the same questions they've been asking for the past century. As annoying as it can be to have to keep rehashing the same arguments and citing the same resources, it's our responsibility, talking about the more experienced socialists here, it's our responsibility to help educate people who come to us with questions. And this is a big one. The answer to the question, what can we do, is multifaceted. A lot of it will depend on where you live. Someone in Russia or Somalia or Indonesia may need to take a different approach than someone in the US, for example. It depends on the material conditions in your country. But there is one thing that has remained constant through all of history and across every single country on Earth, and that's the need to get organized. This is something that Westerners in particular seem to overlook. And it's not entirely our fault. We've been spoon-fed hyper-individualist propaganda for many, many decades. It stands to reason that we default to thinking there must be some individual course of action we each can take. And if you want to look at it that way, Sure, each of us can take the individual, personal step of joining a socialist organization. But we need to shift our perspective to realize that it's only through the collective power of the organization that we actually have any agency to really change things. For most Americans, the first thing that probably comes to mind when we talk about organizing is labor unions. Unions are an example of collective power. One worker standing up to the boss alone is likely to get fired and replaced. But an entire store? That's a different story. We've seen some incredible growth in labor militancy and strike actions in the U.S. over the last few years. From teachers, to doctors, to auto workers, people are unionizing and fighting back against the ruling class. After all, it's only fair. We're the ones who do the work. And while it's amazing to see the victories our unions are winning, it's important to recognize that these victories are still confined to the range of possibilities that exist within capitalism. You can win better conditions at work, but a labor union under capitalism will never be able to alter the relationship between labor, the people who do the work, and capital, the people who own the means by which that work is done. That brings us back to the same question. What do we do? According to most Marxists, we also need to focus on building political organizations to work alongside and within labor unions. Let me read you an excerpt from What is to be Done. Socialism represents the working class, not in its relation to a given group of employers, but in its relation to all classes in modern society, to the state as an organized political force. Hence, it follows that socialists must not confine themselves entirely to the economic struggle. 
we must actively take up the political education of the working class, and the development of its political consciousness. He goes on to say, The question now arises, what does political education mean? Is it sufficient to confine oneself to the propaganda of working class hostility towards autocracy? Of course not. It is not enough to explain to the workers that they are politically oppressed, any more than it was to explain to them that their interests were antagonistic to the interest of the employers. Advantage must be taken of every concrete example of this oppression for the purpose of agitation, in the same way as we began to use concrete examples of economic oppression for the purpose of agitation. And inasmuch as political oppression affects all sorts of classes in society, inasmuch as it manifests itself in various spheres of life and activity, in industrial life, civic life, in personal and family life, in religious life, etc., is it not evident that we shall not be fulfilling our task of developing the political consciousness of the workers if we do not undertake the organization of the political exposure of autocracy in all its aspects. In order to agitate over concrete examples of oppression, these examples must be exposed, in the same way it was necessary to expose factory evils in order to carry out economic agitation. Okay, I think that's fairly clear, but to people who may be unfamiliar with some of the jargon, the gist of the text here is that while it's important to agitate within capitalist firms, say getting your local grocery store workers fired up about wage theft, or showing how the boss takes advantage of workers by capping hours just below full time, it's equally if not more important to help them develop a political understanding of how capitalism as a whole creates all the problems they face both at work and in society at large. How the police protect the interests of capital, how the profit motive leads to crumbling infrastructure, which leads to train derailments that poison entire towns, it's all well and good to expose the evils of the boss, but we also need to expose why the boss acts the way he does. His actions are informed by the capitalist system. If we get rid of capitalism, the antagonism between boss and worker goes away. Okay, so you may have noticed the words agitation, propaganda, and exposure in that passage. What do these terms mean in a political setting? In a nutshell, they all serve roughly the same purpose. Agitation is the process of trying to arouse feelings of discontent, like when you're explaining how a pay raise of any less than the inflation percentage is actually a pay cut. Propaganda, which usually has a negative connotation in this older use of the word, simply means persuasive language, the same sort of thing we'd write in a high school English class, or the stuff that video essay YouTubers do. Exposure has a very particular meaning in this setting. It's used in the common sense, to reveal something that was hidden, but an exposure was also used to refer to a physical thing, like a pamphlet. Here's a passage where Lenin explains the importance of these exposures in economic agitation, specifically in Russia, but this applies to any country. Everyone knows that the spread and consolidation of the economic struggle of the Russian workers proceeded simultaneously with the creation of literature exposing economic conditions, i.e. factory and industrial conditions. These leaflets were devoted mainly to exposure of factory conditions, and very soon a passion for exposures was roused among the workers. As soon as the workers realized that the socialist circles desired to and could supply them with a new kind of leaflet that told the whole truth about their poverty-stricken lives, about their excessive toil and their lack of rights, correspondence began to pour in from the factories and workshops. This exposure literature created a tremendous sensation, not only in the particular factory exposed in the given leaflet, but in all the factories to which news of the revealed facts spread. And since the poverty and want among the workers in the various enterprises and in the various trades are much the same, the truth about the life of the workers stirred everyone. Even among the most backward workers, a veritable passion arose to get into print. A noble passion for this rudimentary form of war against the whole of the present social system which is based upon robbery and oppression. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, these leaflets were in truth a declaration of war, because the exposures served greatly to agitate the workers. They evoked among them common demands for the removal of the most glaring outrages and roused in them a readiness to support the demands with strikes. Finally, the employers themselves were compelled to recognize the significance of these leaflets as a declaration of war. So much so that in a large number of cases, they did not even wait for the outbreak of hostilities. On more than one occasion, the mere appearance of a leaflet proved sufficient to compel an employer to concede all or part of the demands put forward. In a word, economic exposures were and remain an important lever in the economic struggle, and they will continue to retain this significance as long as there is capitalism, which makes it necessary for the workers to defend themselves. Even in the most advanced countries of Europe, it can still be seen that the exposure of abuses in some backward trade, or in some forgotten branch of domestic industry, serves as a starting point for the awakening of class consciousness, for the beginning of a trade union struggle, and for the spread of socialism. 
Okay, that was a long way of saying sharing information about capitalism in the workplace is effective, spooks the ruling class, and helps build a strike movement and favorability of socialism. The same is true today. We may not make use of physical pamphlets quite as much, but a business card with a QR code serves the same purpose. The simple act of exposing the ills of the capitalist labor landscape is often enough to start the snowball down the hill. Once that process has begun, it's critical to work within socialist organizations to pursue the political education of the working class. When new socialists, or just normal people, say things like, we all know this bad stuff is happening, but no one does anything about it. That's a reflection not on the average worker, but on the people who have the time and political understanding to engage in political agitation and fail to do so. Here's Lenin on the subject. Why is it that the Russian workers as yet display so little revolutionary activity in connection with the brutal way in which the police mistreat the people, in connection with the persecution of the religious sects, with the flogging of the peasantry, with the religious censorship, with the persecution of the most innocent cultural enterprises? Is it because the economic struggle does not stimulate them to this? Because such political activity does not promise palpable results? To advance this argument is merely to shift the blame onto the shoulders of others, to blame the masses of workers for our own failings. We must blame ourselves, our remoteness from the mass movement. We must blame ourselves for being unable as yet to recognize a sufficiently wide, striking, and rapid exposure of these despicable outrages. Only those who themselves go into action now can make appeals for action. And our business as socialists is to deepen, expand, and intensify political exposures and political agitation. How's it feel to be called out from 120 years in the past? What Lenin's talking about here is something we really struggle with today. We assume someone else is going to do the work. Someone else can organize the masses, unite the various unions, provide political education. We'll show our support when it's convenient. That's not how this works. There's no single savior. We're all responsible, all of us who are aware of the evils of capitalism. We all have to do the work. To get organized, join a socialist organization, and do the work ourselves, not as atomized individuals, but as a united front of socialists and workers. And a related issue we struggle with is that many of us put too much faith in spontaneous movements, assuming that once things get bad enough, a critical mass of people will rise up and fix everything in one glorious social movement. That's not how this works either. Think about the Black Lives Matter movement. We had a whole summer where huge numbers of people were protesting across the country, blocking traffic, confronting the servants of capital, even torching a police station. But what came of that? We got a street named after the movement and the Democrats put on a little show. No material change came of this massive uprising because it wasn't politically organized. It didn't really even have concrete demands. There was plenty of righteous anger, which is good, but without a way to channel that into forcing specific change, it was always destined to be co-opted or fizzle out. Here's Lenin on the subject of spontaneity. Here he's talking about some recent strike movements in Russia. The fact that these strikes spread over the whole of Russia showed how deep the reviving popular movement was. And if we must speak of the spontaneous element, then of course we must admit that this strike movement bore a spontaneous character. Strikes occurred in Russia in the 1860s and 70s, as well as the first half of the 19th century. And these strikes were accompanied by the spontaneous destruction of machinery, etc. Compared with these revolts, the strikes of the 1890s might even be described as conscious. To such an extent do they mark the progress which the labor movement had made since that period. This shows that the spontaneous element, in essence, represents nothing more nor less than consciousness in its embryonic form. Even the primitive rebellions expressed the awakening of consciousness to a certain extent. The workers abandoned their age-long faith in the permanence of the system which oppressed them. They began, I shall not say to understand, but to sense the necessity of collective resistance. I'm sure you've heard the expression, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. This struggle against capitalism is about as clear an example as it gets. Large, righteous, and disorganized uprisings failed because of a lack of political vision. But the seed of understanding was there. When people ask, what can we do, this is the answer. Join organizations that are working towards building the political program necessary to unite the working class under a single banner. There is nothing we can do alone against the oppressive capitalist regimes of the world. The only thing that has ever worked in the past is the only thing that will work today. Mass mobilization and political organization. That's why the expression agitate, educate, organize is so common in socialist circles. That's the formula. 
I'm going to leave some resources in the description, as well as links to all the main US socialist organizations. They all have their pros and cons, they all have their problems, and God knows they all hate each other. We socialists are really good at not getting along. I've personally worked with CPUSA and DSA, but join whatever is available in your area, even if you don't agree with them on everything. It is way more valuable to get involved and start working with other socialists towards a brighter future than it is to criticize from the sidelines. Okay, that's pretty much it for this episode. Thanks for coming to my little book club. I only focused on one aspect of the struggle for socialism here. There's a lot more to it, so make sure you go check out Hakim's video as well. He's got some great advice that applies wherever you live in the world. I've also got a Discord server for my patrons where we do an actual book club, and I try to do a live Q&A every month. So if you appreciate my work, consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does help keep this operation afloat. Go get organized, and I'll see you next time.